Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to introduce uh, Dr. George Walsh, whom I'm sure is uh, known to most of you. It's his third time back here at TJS, and we're very glad to have him once again. So, Dr. Walsh. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Every civilization is characterized by a set of fundamental ideas and an ensuing sense of life, which is the result of those fundamental ideas. The set of fundamental ideas is passed on from generation to generation, and for this reason, is called a tradition. Our civilization, Western civilization, is almost unique in the sense of being based on two very divergent traditions, the Greek and the Judeo-Christian. I am using the term quote, Greek tradition, unquote, to refer to the predominant strain in Greek culture, which stood for the view that the universe, or cosmos as they called it, is intelligible and hospitable to man, and that man is, in essence, a glorious and perfectible being whose destiny it is to find happiness in this cosmos by the use of his rational faculty. The most consistent proponent of the Greek tradition was Aristotle, and it, and it is to this great thinker that we are indebted for its most lucid articulation and its most unwavering advocacy. In identifying the Greek tradition as rational, I am not denying that there was also an irrational strain in ancient Greece. Indeed, this irrational Greek strain was swept up into our second major tradition, the Judeo-Christian tradition, and later helped the Judeo-Christian tradition to gain its foothold and finally rise to a predominance that lasted for centuries. If you can hear me, would you put up your palm like that and let me know? By the Judeo-Christian tradition, I mean a common set of ideas and values generated in the Jewish and Christian religions. These religions are in many ways quite different from one another, and their modes of expressing the ideas and values are somewhat divergent. Yet, as I shall argue, the areas of agreement are far more important than the areas of divergence. These four lectures will attempt to describe, analyze, and evaluate the Judeo-Christian tradition. The first two lectures will supply the indispensable historical framework, the first lecture being devoted to Judaism and the second to Christianity. The second two lectures will analyze and evaluate the content of the tradition, the third being devoted to fundamental principles in ethics, politics, and economics, and the fourth being devoted largely to sex. The fourth lecture will end in a summary of the basic theses or positions of the Judeo-Christian ethics and will conclude with an estimate of the future of the tradition, namely an estimate of the conditions, always allowing for man's free will, the conditions of the traditions continuing to maintain its strong grip on our culture. I now come to the matrix of the Judeo-Christian tradition, which I placed during the period 400 B.C. to 100 A.D. 
the matrix of the Judeo-Christian tradition began about 400 B.C. It was in about 400 B.C. that the scribe Ezra, E-Z-R-A, backed by the police power of the king of Persia, imposed upon all the inhabitants of Judea the now-completed code of regulations known as the Jewish law, the practice of which would fully and irrevocably segregate the Jews from all other people. And it was about 135 A.D. that a prayer was inserted into the synagogue liturgy. Quote, May the Nazarenes and the heretics be suddenly destroyed and removed from the book of life, unquote, marking the decisive act of throwing the Christians out of the synagogues. And about this time also that a council of rabbis meeting at a place called Jamnia, now called Yibna, about 13 miles south of Tel Aviv, laid down once and for all the basic structure of normative or orthodox Judaism. During this period of five centuries, the Judeo-Christian tradition in its two alternate forms of Judaism and Christianity had finally crystallized. So Ezra was your man who formulated classical Judaism. He was about 400 B.C. For our purposes, Jewish history may be divided into the following periods. The first period was 1800 to 1000 BC. It was characterized by semi-nomadic life on the fringe of the Fertile Crescent, tribes wandering back and forth between uh, Babylonia and Egypt. The second period is called the period of the first commonwealth, the first commonwealth, and it lasted from 1000 B.C. to 577 B.C. This was a period of Jewish statehood, of settled life, both rural and urban, ruled by kings. The third period was from 577 to 500 B.C., a period of only 75 years, uh, during which the leading Jewish families were exiled in Babylon. The fourth period is called the period of the Second Commonwealth, when once again there was a Jewish state, and this lasted from 500 B.C. to 70 A.D. When I say once again a a Jewish state, I meant a state under either native or foreign rule, but nevertheless with Jewish under-administrators. And the fifth period uh, is the period of the completion of the dispersion or diaspora of the Jews. Diaspora means the dispersion or uh, scattering of the Jews around the world. And this became complete about the year 70 A.D. and lasted to 1948 A.D. when the state of Israel was established. The Judaic tradition can only be explained in terms of the situation which gave it birth, the invasion of the rich agricultural and urban civilization of Canaan, Canaan, that is to say Palestine, by a semi-nomadic, highly tribalized people called the Israelites. This invasion took place between 1200 and 1000 B.C. To understand the critical nature of this confrontation, 
let us look at the two societies involved. First, let us look at the civilization of the native peoples of Palestine, the Canaanites. Canaanite civilization was the civilization of a settled urban society. Its economy was based on agriculture and trade. It was made up of small city-states, each ruled by a king with absolute power. The king was also regarded as a priest, the mediator between his people and the gods. The society was not based on tribal blood relationships. It was a feudal society with land or privileges conferred in exchange for military service. The land was worked with the conscripted labor of peasants. The state's main source of income was trade, and the king was the chief trader. There were also some very rich private businessmen and others who amassed wealth as business agents of the king. It was a relatively prosperous mixed economy. The Canaanite religion was polytheistic. They had many gods. Each piece of land had its landlord god called a Baal, B-A-A-L, Baal. Each little piece of land had its own Baal, who had to be propitiated in order to ensure a good rainfall and a good harvest. in order to ensure also the fertility of the farm animals and the fertility of the human family living on the land. Each local Baal granted or withheld fertility at will. He died each year with the drying up of the soil at the beginning of summer, and people mourned his death, weeping and tearing their hair. He was reborn with the autumn rains, and his rebirth was greeted by singing, dancing, and orgies designed to encourage him to restore fertility to the farm. Each city had a temple in honor of its patron Baal, and since these cities were built on dominating heights, their shrines are referred to in the Bible by the name High Places. The image of the god inside his shrine could be dimly seen by the worshipers, and outside the shrine stood a mazeba, or pillar, a large phallic symbol. Sacrifices were offered and eaten in communion meals. Temples were served by sacred prostitutes, including homosexual prostitutes. At the head of all the Baals was the great Baal, a youthful, vigorous storm god incessantly fighting monsters. Children were sacrificed to the great Baal. There was also a great Bawa, or female Baal, named Ashtaroth, or Astarte, goddess of fertility, who was usually represented naked. She was also the goddess of vengeance, When either side of her nature got out of control, she really was something. She she sometimes grabbed a sword, sprang naked on a horse, and rode forth to slaughter. In the fertility festivals in the autumn, she represented the soil, and Baal, the storm god, was supposed to fertilize her by his rain. The word for god, any god, was El, E-L. And at the top of the hierarchy, there was capital L, or God, a remote being who was regarded as the creator of heaven and earth and of all the other gods. From the word L was derived the Arabic name Allah. It is obvious that the religion of the Canaanites was a nature religion. Divinity permeated all nature and was concerned with keeping natural processes going. The religion of the Canaanites was also a cyclical religion, being tied to the cycles of life and the seasons. Sexuality and aggression were sacred forces pervading all nature. 
there was nothing really outside nature. The universe was regarded as a vast conglomeration of gods and men, sort of wheeling around. The world outlook of the Canaanites was not rational, but it was, in a sense, secular, in the sense of affirming the goodness of all natural processes, the enjoyment of life, sex, health, and wealth, and so on. Being irrational, it had some gruesome and monstrous sides, such as child sacrifice. It was this civilization which the Israelites faced when they invaded Canaan. They confronted it with a world outlook which was vastly different from the Canaanite. The Israelites were breeders of small cattle, sheep, goats, and asses. They were semi-nomads. Part of the year they moved around with their flocks in the unsettled grasslands on the borders of Canaan. Then, when their flocks had consumed all the available fodder, the Israelites negotiated grazing rights with nearby farmers whose fields had already been harvested. Sometimes they settled down and planted some crops. As a result, they developed an ambivalent attitude towards settled life. On the one hand, they dreamed of a promised land flowing with milk and honey where they could eat and drink and enjoy all the goodies of civilization. On the other hand, they wanted to preserve the tribal ties of desert life. The understanding of this ambivalence helps us to understand the ambivalence of Jews throughout history who have alternately been attracted to the individualist life of urban centers on the one hand and the communal life of kibbutzim on the other hand, to the joys of secular living on the one hand and the strict observance of the Torah on the other. The invading Israelites of 1200 or so BC felt this ambivalence keenly. Let us look for a moment at the tribal tradition of the Israelites to see how different it was from the uh, non-tribal tradition of the Canaanites. The tribal way of life of the Israelites depended on blood relationships. Families named after the father extended into larger units called clans named after a remote ancestor, and clans extended into still larger units called tribes named after a still more remote ancestor. The whole group of Israelite tribes were supposed to be descended from a very remote ancestor named Israel or Jacob, his father Isaac and his father Abraham. Jacob had lived about five centuries before, and the various tribes were descended from him. Some tribes by his first wife Leah, six tribes. Some by her maid Zilpah, two tribes. Some by his second wife, Rachel, one tribe. Some by her maid, Bilpah, two tribes. Whatever god or gods they worshipped, they were united in the worship of a god called El Shaddai, which means the god of the plains or possibly the god of the mountain. Let's call him the god of the plains. That's the most accepted interpretation today. This god was also called the god of the fathers. He was a nomadic deity who had revealed himself to a remote ancestor, Abraham. A, who had, the god adopted Abraham and his descendants, promised land and posterity to them, and was now accompanying and guarding the whole group deciding where the people should go and keeping them safe on their way. Now, some of the southern tribes crossed the border into Egypt, where they were conscripted for forced labor. These must have included the tribe of Levi, L-E-V-I. We call that, pronounce it in English, Levi. <laughs> uh, a so-called Leah tribe the only tribe that later bore Egyptian names. At any rate, among these tribes in Egypt arose a great leader with the Egyptian name of Moses. Moses had experienced a revelation in which a god had appeared to him. 
This God announced that his name was Yahweh, Y-A-H-W-E-H, -E Yahweh. the meaning of which we do not know, but it may mean he is, he is. According to one component document of the Bible, Yahweh is recorded as having said to Moses, I am Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, but I did not make myself known to them by my name Yahweh. I promised to give them the, name, the land of Canaan, Say, therefore, to the Israelite people, I am Yahweh. I will redeem you from bondage to the Egyptians, and I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'll give it to you to be your own possession. Moses, armed with this message, persuaded the enslaved Israelites to follow him. And he then led them successfully out of Egypt in a feat, according to the Bible, teeming with miracles. He brought them to the foot of a mountain. We don't know just which mountain it was, but it's referred to as Sinai. Yahweh called to Moses from the top of the mountain, tell this to the Israelites. You have seen with your own eyes how I have delivered you out of Egypt. I have a covenant to make with you. I will make you my special possession, for the whole earth is mine. But you must keep the covenant which I am about to offer. <coughs> excuse, excuse me. <coughs> Moses told the people of the offered covenant, and they agreed to it in advance. Moses went back and told Yahweh that his offer that couldn't be refused had been accepted. <laughs> Yahweh, Yahweh then said to Moses, I will come to you in a thick cloud in order that the people may hear me when I speak to you, and then they will trust you always. First, I want you to set up barriers around the mountain, and whoever touches the barrier shall be shot dead. But when the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they will be allowed to approach. Meanwhile, there shall be no sex for three days." Unquote. When the, when, when the third day came, there was thunder and lightning and a dense cloud on the mountain. Moses led the trembling people to the foot of the mountain. Yahweh came down on the mountain in fire. Smoke arose from the mountain as from an oven, and the whole mountain trembled violently. The blare of the ram's horn grew louder and louder. Whenever Moses spoke, Yahweh answered him with the sound of thunder. Meanwhile, Moses kept warning the people back, saying that they would die if they caught a glimpse of Yahweh's face. However, Yahweh did relent and allow Moses' brother Aaron and a select few to come up and view Yahweh from a safe distance for a moment. Then Moses came down from the mountain, built an, offer, an altar, sacrificed some bulls, threw half their blood on the altar, sprinkled the other half on the people to signify the covenant. Then Moses read to the people the terms of the covenant, in other words, the Mosaic law. The earliest edition of the Mosaic law, which is the basis of our Judeo-Christian tradition, is contained in the book of Exodus, chapters 20 through 24. At the core are the famous Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are supposed to be the ethical base of the Judeo-Christian tradition. When we look at the Ten Commandments, it is easy to see that they fall into two groups, the last six and the first four. The last six are honor your father and mother, do not commit murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Do not covet what belongs to others. I want to say two things about this group of six commandments. First of all, their content is not unique to the Judeo-Christian tradition. Such moral principles and the values lying behind them 
are shared by many ethical and legal systems and by many other societies. Secondly, however, there is a difference. These commandments are absolute. They contain no provisions for exceptions. There are no situations in which it is permitted not to honor one's father and mother, for example. These commandments are given in a form that Immanuel Kant was later to call apodictic. This is a word you should memorize. It means unyielding, unconditional, absolutely necessary. In the form of absolute categorical imperatives, other moral codes contain provisos for special situations or for mitigations. These commandments do not. Now, why do they have these? Uh, why do they have this absolute form? Because they are revealed. Because the nature of the revealer is hidden from the scrutiny of reason. And because he, the revealer refuses to entertain any questions as to the premises behind the commandments or behind any of his actions, his answer is always, because I say so. This is clearly brought out when we examine the other group of commandments, the first four commandments. I am Yahweh, your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make a carved image of me or of any natural object or bow down to such an image, for I, Yahweh, your God, am a jealous God. You shall not use my name lightly. You shall not do any work on the seventh day, the Sabbath. Now, these commandments are unique in the Judaic tradition. They deal with attitudes and actions to be taken up by those who accept the last six commandments. Attitudes toward the revealer of the commandments, Yahweh. First, Yahweh is to be the only object of reverence. He openly says he's jealous. Secondly, he's not to be represented as having any form. Now, form is what you can scrutinize with your senses or examine by your reason. Form means identity. But Yahweh is beyond form, beyond identity, beyond identification. If you ask him what he is, he answers, I am inscrutable. Now, all nature has form. Yahweh is therefore beyond all nature, beyond the universe. Just as epideictic is the correct word for his commands, so transcendent and inscrutable are the correct words for his nature. Transcendent. He's hidden. He's beyond our scrutiny. His name must not be used lightly. Later, the Jews elaborated this commandment so as to prohibit the very pronunciation of the name Yahweh. There is thus a prohibition of perceiving Yahweh. There is a prohibition of framing a concept of him, and finally, a prohibition of naming him. All the elements of a proper epistemology are thus violated. See the account of concept formation in Ayn Rand's introduction to objectivist epistemology. Finally, there is the consecration of a special day to Yahweh a day on which man's productive activities must come to a complete halt in order to acknowledge the fact that Yahweh is the supreme creator. Besides the famous Ten Commandments, there are many other commandments in this earliest document of the law. Among them are the statements like this, whoever worships another god shall be put to death. A witch shall not be permitted to live. You must realize that this is not merely an ethical code. It is at the same time a political code, a system of criminal law. All ethical prohibitions are to be enforced by the police. Quote, he who strikes his father or mother shall be put to death, unquote. Calvin ordered a, a young child to be decapitated for striking his father in Geneva in the 16th century. 
Among other prohibitions is one against lending money at interest to a fellow Israelite. This prohibition, prohibition of so-called usury, was to have many repercussions in history. Some of the prohibitions go rather far. The prohibition against nakedness is so extreme that it is forbidden to build an altar on steps, lest presumably some voyeur peer up the priest's vestments as he ascends the steps. This is the first trace of the extreme obsessiveness that later grew to such enormous proportions in the rabbi's additions to the law. The law of Moses was generally stricter than the laws of other peoples. For instance, the Mosaic Code was far stricter in matters of sex. In other codes, a husband may forgive an adulterous wife and her lover. The law of Moses ordered, orders both the wife and the lover to be put to death. Why? Because the act is not just an offense against the husband, but against God. All irregular forms of sex were banned. Incest was regarded as particularly horrible. This whole attitude towards sex was passed on by Judaism to Christianity and Islam, and you know the results. I might here mention the fact that so-called crimes against property were played down. This was an expression of the tribal nomad's sense of communal possession and belief in economic equality. So much for the oldest forms of the Mosaic law. It was accepted from Moses by the southern tribes who had been in Egypt. After Moses' death, another great leader named Joshua persuaded the northern tribes to accept the religion and the law. The tribes were now merged into a great confederacy and began to invade the land of the Canaanites with full military force, uh, with the Ark of Yahweh going on before. Soon they would conquer all of Canaan and their religion would confront that of the Canaanites. We've already seen what the religion of the Canaanites was. We've characterized it as one of very mixed values, at once worldly and irrational. We have spoken of it as a nature religion and as cyclical in its point of view. One generation was pictured as following the same pattern as the previous generation in a yearly round of agricultural festivals, propitiating the gods who seemed interested only in these natural cycles. The religion of the Israelites, on the other hand, was not at all concerned with the cycles of nature. It was concerned with what had happened in history, what was happening and what would happen to the whole group of people called Israel. Together, this people had gone through rough times. They had received an offer through the God of their fathers of a promised land. They had been enslaved in Egypt. Then they had been liberated. But then the God of the fathers, revealing himself under a new name and as a warrior God, had miraculously redeemed them from slavery and was now leading them on into the promised land. He had initiated them to be his chosen people, and they agreed to abandon the worship of all other gods. He would lead them into the promised land, defeating all their enemies, provided they followed his law and worshipped him alone. He would reward them by giving them lands, children, and flocks in abundance. The acceptance of Yahwism by the Israelites meant, therefore, the adoption of a linear or straight-line view of history as opposed to the cyclical view of history uh, characteristic of the Canaanites, a linear view of history as opposed to the cyclical view. What interested them was, were the events along the straight line. Creation, going down to Egypt, getting liberated from Egypt, promises by their God, miraculous deliverances, improbable victories, and so on. It was a whole philosophy of history that was to influence all Western civilization through the spread of the Jewish and Christian religions. 
This is the philosophy of history that we are to see later in Augustine, in Hegel, and in Marx. In this scheme, the field of history is pictured as a battleground in which some are chosen, be they Jews, Christians, Germans, the proletariat, what not, chosen to be the agents of order and light against chaos and darkness. The invading Israelites regarded themselves as chosen people united in a covenant. They were to keep his law, Yahweh's law, and if they did, they would be rewarded by lands and children. It was a two-way street. God had to do his part, too. Now, this is a very brittle position for any religion. For what if it turned out that the wicked, that is, those who did not keep the law, suppose they prospered, they did. And what if it turned out that those who did keep the law suffered misfortune? They did. This is what happened again and again throughout all Jewish history. So it set the stage for the so-called problem of evil. Now, the invading Israelites captured Jerusalem from the Canaanites and completed the conquest of the country. They settled down to an agricultural and urban life. They had kings for the first time, the great kings, David and Solomon. But in the very process of settling down, the Israelites underwent great tension between the new life and the old social values they had brought in from the desert. First of all, they had to be farmers. But remember that in Canaanite, every patch of land had its bow or fertility god who had to be propitiated with sacrifices and orgies. If, according to the local edition of the farmer's almanac, the crops were to grow. Some of the Israelites thought this was great and took to the orgies like fish to water. <laughs> also, just to be on the right side of things, they worshipped Yahweh as well. What was emerging was what we call a syncretistic or mixed religion, syncretistic. Worshipping both. The kings added to this syncretism. David brought the ark with its stone tablets of the law to Jerusalem. He set it down in a shrine. He made it stationary something it had never been before. He and all Israel performed Canaanite dances before it, accompanied by harps and lutes, tambourines and cymbals. Soon David proclaimed that Yahweh had made a second covenant with him personally, parallel to the original covenant he had made with Israel, a covenant that channeled divine benefactions through the king and his dynasty to the people. From this time on, the belief took hold that the king of Israel must be in the line of David, the son of David. Later, when Israel was under foreign domination, the people looked for someone who was a descendant of David to appear and redeem the nation from its oppressors. This coming redeemer was called the Anointed One or the Messiah. The corresponding Greek term, of course, is Christ, a fateful concept that the Jews uh, uh, left after them. Solomon, David's king, succeeded him in 965 B.C. He brought the kingdom to wealth and power. The local Canaanite population was largely absorbed, and Solomon allowed the worship of the fertility gods to flourish alongside that of Yahweh. To Yahweh, he built a great temple in Jerusalem in Phoenician style to house the Ark of the Covenant. The ark was placed in a dark central room, a room called the Holy of Holies. And right around in the neighborhood of the temple, Solomon built temples for the gods of many of his non-Israelite wives. Come now to point number 11. I want to say a few words about the origin of the Bible. Every religious cult requires a sacred story to explain the meaning of of its ritual acts and festivals. So now a cult official, or maybe a committee of cult officials, began composing the first document of what we now call the Hebrew Bible, 
or Christians call it the Old Testament, the book which became the main literary source of the Judeo-Christian tradition. The writing of the documents, which was done in many places, took about 800 years from about 965 to about 165 B.C. and was made official for the Jews at the Council of Jamnia about 100 A.D. at the beginning of the final dispersion of the Jews, the Council of Jamnia or Yibne. Following Solomon's death, the ten northern tribes seceded from the south and set up their own kingdom of Israel in the north. The remaining kingdom of the south was called Judah, with its capital at Jerusalem. The kingdom of the north was called Israel, with its capital at Samaria. The kings of Israel severed all religious ties with Jerusalem and set up a shrine in the north with the old totem image of the golden bull, uh, to stand for Yahweh. In both kingdoms, the amalgamation of the two religions, Yahwism and the fertility religion of the Canaanites, continued. In both kingdoms, the kings and their hangers-on lived luxuriously on heavy taxes and enforced labor in the royal mixed economy style of other kingdoms of the Near East. And then along came the prophets. In both kingdoms, there arose prophets of Yahweh who announced the decadence, dishonesty, seizure of property by the kings, and so on. But in the message of the prophets, there was a kind of package deal. People were being asked to choose between two false alternatives. On the one hand, a whole list of values, including urban life, luxurious living, breaking contracts, expropriation of private property, the worship of fertility gods. On the other hand, a list of values which included honest, decent, upright living, the life of the poor shepherd, retreat to the desert, living in tents, and sincerely worshiping Yahweh. The coming of this prophetic religion marked the definitive appearance within the Judeo-Christian tradition of protest in the name of what has been called ever since social justice. This kind of protest is addressed to the rich man who feels guilty because he is rich, but who has tried to get rid of his guilt by contributing to his local church or synagogue, endowing chapels, buying splendid vestments for the clergy, and so on. This is the kind of compromise policy that has supported establishment religion ever since the beginning of the syncretism between the Israelite and Canaanite traditions. It is against this establishment religion that the radical prophets were protesting. They were protesting in the name of a standard of values derived generations before from the nomadic tribes of the desert. So the rich temple-going city dweller is being recalled to the values of his great-great-great-grandfather. Supposedly, it is the voice of Yahweh, the God of the fathers, speaking to them through the mouth of the prophet. I'll quote the prophet Amos about 750 B.C. Woe, woe to the city dwellers, lolling on their ivory divans, sprawling on their couches, dining off fresh lamb and fatted veal, crooning to the music of the lute, downing wine by the bowlful, covering themselves with lotions, number 50, uh, with never a single thought for the bleeding wounds of the nation. I spurn your high holy days. I hate them. I scorn them. Your sacrifices, I will not smell their smoke. You offer me your gifts. I will not accept them. You offer me fatted cattle. I will not look at them. No more of your hymns for me. I will not listen to your lutes. We thus see a conflict between ideals derived from a pastoral life with ideals derived from a settled life. As I've pointed out, this conflict existed from the beginning of Israelite history, but now it became exacerbated by the preaching of the prophets. 
The old story of the Tower of Babel was recalled, the moral being that the attempt to build a skyscraper is a challenge to God. And he had punished men for so doing. The story of Cain and Abel was also recalled. God had preferred the gifts of Abel, who was a herdsman, over the gifts of Cain, who was a cultivator of the earth. Cain slew Abel because he believed Abel was unjustly favored. Then when God asked Cain where Abel was, Cain answered, Am I my brother's keeper? Brothers, and all are responsible for their brothers. Many Israelites, as I've said, were ambivalent between the two sets of ideals, pastoral versus settled. But there were some of the pastoralist party who carried their point of view to the extreme, and they are called Rechabites. Now, these were the really orthodox, orthodox faction, dating back to at least 800 B.C. The Rechabites made three solemn vows not to sow fields or possess vineyards, not to build houses, but to remain tent dwellers all their lives, and not to drink wine. Here we find a group of Israelites regarding themselves as purer and more observant than the others, and approaching in their attitudes those of the pure nomads of the desert, camel nomads, the Arabs. Here we can mark the entry into the Judeo-Christian tradition of such tendencies as moral and religious Puritanism and neo-primitivism, tendencies which we can trace later in the Dead Sea sect, Christian monasticism, Christian Puritanism, Islam, and all of them philosophically in Rousseau and all the varieties of socialism in the 19th and 20th centuries. So the message of the prophets may be summarized in this way. Yahweh alone is to be worshipped. Agricultural and urban modes of life breed injustice. Tribal values and desert ideals are models of justice. And that if the Israelites continue in their corrupt way, Yahweh would bring woe upon them, which meant they would be conquered by foreign powers. The message of the prophets evoked much popular sympathy because of its nationalism. Yahweh was like the flag, the god of the nation, and the nation was in danger of attack. The message also contained a threat that if the pure worship of Yahweh were not reestablished, Yahweh himself would bring foreign powers to conquer the Israelites. Now, if Yahweh could control the foreign powers, he must be sovereign over all nations, in effect, the only God. This was an age in which all the people of the Middle East were hungering after one God to establish peace throughout the nation, in fact, throughout the region, rather. In fact, they were tending toward monotheism. Now, the Israelites had in their jealous God, Yahweh, the national God, who could most easily, the one who could be most easily transformed conceptually into the one and only God, the controller, even the creator of the universe. The Israelites, therefore, became the first nation that adopted monotheism, the doctrine that there is only one God. Soon after the message of the prophets came the fulfillment of the threat of woe. In 721 BC, the northern kingdom was conquered. In reaction to this disaster, a party of religious reform arose in the southern kingdom and came to power under King Josiah. Josiah repressed all the fertility cults, centralized the worship of Yahweh in the temple in Jerusalem, and established a purified religion based on a new edition of the law. And it was expected that now that we've cleaned up our act, uh, Judah would be saved from the fate of Israel. But it was not to be. In 587 BC, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, captured Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and deported 5,000 of the leading educated Jews to Babylon, where the whole group of them remained for about 75 years. 
While prospering in business, they remained a distinct community, growing ever more exclusive and concerned with the preservation of their own identity. What had happened, they asked. The reforms of King Josiah had apparently failed to appease Jehovah's wrath, Yahweh's wrath. What was the explanation of all this evil? And a prophet named Ezekiel came along who preached that the sufferings of the Jews were due to the fact that even after the reforms, some Jews had retained some heathen practices. What the Jews need, he said, is to purify themselves absolutely, to become strictly observant. If we will only do this, continued Ezekiel, God will restore the kingdom of Israel and Judah. So here we have one solution. The reason for all your sufferings is you're not pure enough. Rid yourself of impurities and victory is sure. This solution, which I will call the Ezekiel solution, has recently been advanced in an extreme form by a certain Rabbi Yaakov Homnik of Chicago. I quote from Rabbi Homnik. Quote, especially is the Holocaust a proof of God's justice, coming as it does at the climax of a century in which the vast majority of Jews, after thousands of years of loyalty in exile, decided to cast off the yoke of the law, unquote. This remark was made in the course of a debate with the late Sidney Hook, who replied, the rabbi cannot be unaware that the vast majority of the Jewish victims of the Holocaust were as orthodox as he is. And even if they constituted only a minority of world Jewry, where is the justice of their punishment or in that of their wives and children? Unquote. A more radical solution was proposed by a writer in the Babylonian captivity called Second Isaiah. Second Isaiah vividly portrays an individual called the suffering servant. The suffering servant was a symbol of the Jewish people. The suffering servant, though innocent, is horribly persecuted in obedience to the will of God. Why does he suffer? It is for the sins of others, vicarious suffering. Although, I quote from Second Isaiah, this is in the Bible, he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. He's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. With his stripes are we healed. The Lord hath lain on him the iniquity of us all. He, has brought, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before the shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. This suffering servant was identical, but identified by rabbinical commentators with the Jewish people uh, who are suffering for the sins of others. Here then we have the second solution to the suffering of the Jewish people. The first was that they had not observed the law strictly enough and that they should clean up their act. This is the Ezekiel solution. The second solution, aware of the objection that most of the sufferers are innocent, openly proclaims that it is precisely their innocence that makes their suffering valuable in the eyes of God. Their innocent suffering creates a treasury of merit from which God dispenses rewards to those who have earned nothing, like the non-observant Jews uh, who uh, did not sh observe the simplest ethic. Another principle has now been added to the Judeo-Christian tradition the principle of a vicarious atonement with its corollary of the transfer of merit from those who have earned it to those who haven't. A third solution is the solution given in the book of Job, dating from perhaps 500 BC. Job is a very wealthy man, rich in lands, possessions, and children. He is a devoutly observant man in religious matters and otherwise upright in his life. Satan suggests to God that maybe the reason Job is so virtuous is in order to earn all these rewards from God. God becomes disturbed at this suggestion, and he allows Satan to conduct a controlled experiment to see if this is so. 
First, Satan kills all the flocks of Job. Then he kills Job's children in a tornado. Job's only response is, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Then Satan smites Job with a disease which sounds something like AIDS. <laughs> this is beginning to, this then begins to get to Job. <laughs> and he examines his conscience to see if he's done anything to deserve all this. Finding himself innocent, he questions God. Why are you allowing this to happen to an innocent man? Why, why? Then comes a second tornado. God answers Job. Who are you to dare to ask questions? I will ask questions and you will answer. If anyone just came in, this is not the question period that's gone. <laughs> that's gone. Uh, uh, where, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Do you understand lightning, thunder, the movements of the tides? Do you understand how animals are constructed? Can you draw out Leviathan from the sea with a hook? Are you trying to instruct me? He who dares to question me, the Almighty, had better be prepared to answer for it. Job replies, in effect, I guess I was presumptuous to question things beyond the power of my reason. I'm sorry. I know you are the Almighty. I repent in dust and ashes. Then the Almighty was very pleased, and he gave Job back everything that he'd lost. Not the same children, but ten brand new children. Uh, now, the book of Job is a departure from the previous Israelite tradition. The old tradition had been that God rewards the just and punishes the unjust. One could even argue with God, reminding him of his promises under the covenant. Now with the book of Job comes a new message, a twofold message. message. Don't dare to question God because he's beyond human comprehension. And his benefits are not necessarily earned by any human standard. The same goes for the misfortunes he sends. This is a foretaste of Islam, and it should be added of Augustine's doctrine of predestination. So just as Puritanism entered Judaism with the Rechabites, so now does its accompaniment the doctrine that God's decrees are inscrutable enters as well. The Jews in Babylon uh, accepted the Ezekiel solution, namely that their failure to observe the law exactly and precisely was the cause of their misfortunes. So their young men devoted their spare time not to sports or to chasing girls, but to the study of the law. And the law itself was steadily becoming more complicated. Fences were being built around the law, extra prohibitions against touching something that had touched something that had touched something that was unclean. Eggs laid on the Sabbath were declared unclean. And needless to say, in the patriarchal society, the ways in which women could become unclean were much more numerous than the ways in which man could become unclean. The law kept growing and growing into a massive, obsessive, system. Complicated dietary regulations were involved. It became difficult to socialize with non-Jews and impossible to marry them. The Jews in Babylon became, in a period of 75 years, more and more exclusive and more and more isolated, more and more what I would call law cadets. Uh, suddenly, in 538 B.C., uh, Babylon was conquered by Cyrus the Great of Persia. He allowed those Jews who wished to return home. A minority of them did. They were not welcome. The inhabitants had experienced a time of religious liberty. They had never experienced such a regime of religious authoritarianism as they now had to endure. 
The temple was rebuilt, although on a more modest scale. Around the year 400, the fanatical scribe named Ezra arrived armed with the authority of the king of Persia to publish the elaborate version of the law we now have in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Ezra called an assembly of all the Jews who had not gone to Babylon. And he read them the law and the riot act as well, ordering them under penalty of Persian law to divorce their non-Jewish wives. As the Bible says, there was much weeping and lamentation. This year, 400 in round numbers, marks the birth of, what, of classical Judaism, as I have called it. By classical Judaism, I mean the religion demanding the observance of all the laws in the first five books of the Bible, including the animal sacrifices in the temple, all the dietary laws, circumcision of infant males, and so on. As one commentator, W.K. Lowther Clark, says, quote, No more striking example is found in history of the power of a determined minority to influence the course of events than the fact that Judaism, as we now call Hebrew polity, was conceived in Babylonia and imposed on Judea, unquote. After the overthrow of the Persian Empire by Alexander the Great in 333 BC, the Hellenizing of the Near East began. I want to quote this same man, Lothar Clark, again, his biblical commentary. Quote, colonies of Greeks were planted all over the vast area, but at best they must have formed a small minority of the population. That is all over the Mediterranean basin. The conquest was effective because it was a spiritual one and the new civilization was accepted as definitely higher than anything previously known. This is Greek civilization. For the first time, Asiatics were introduced to political life. Knowledge of Greek opened the door to drama, philosophy, and science. Athletics and the cult of the body came in. A fuller and richer, if more secular, life could now be lived. Even among the Jews, many succumbed to the new influence." Unquote. Now, there was a profound antithesis between the Hellenistic and the Jewish spirit. Hellenism was a great enlightened civilization that had spread all over the Mediterranean basin. It was rational, empirical, open to new knowledge, critical. It was relaxed, harmonious, open to the joys of both the mind and the body, both of which it prized and trained. Its gods were anthropomorphic, subject to rational criticism. It was a man-worshipping civilization. The Jewish spirit, on the other hand, exalted God above man's understanding or reach. It did not even raise the question whether God existed. God was assumed on faith. Did man's reasoning have any place? Yes. Yes, to figure out exactly what God wanted, pouring over the law endlessly, seeking to perform the rituals exactly, and to avoid contamination by the foods or practices of the Gentiles, whom they abhorred. The Greeks, for their part, were horrified at the Jewish dietary laws, at the fact that this able people should not, could not share a common life together with the Greeks. They were horrified at the Jewish practice of circumcision, which they regarded as a mutilation of the body, and at the Jewish taboo on nakedness. Many Jews, admiring the Greek point of view, became thoroughly Hellenized. One of the signs of the time was the presence of merchants outside the gymnasia selling artificial foreskins to those who wished to enter. Even... Even many of the priests became thoroughly Hellenized. In 175 BC, there was a high priest who called himself Joshua Jason, Joshua Jason, who scandalized the observant Jews by leading his priests in gymnastics, clad only in the Hellenistic equivalent of golf caps. <laughs> Ar armed, op armed opposition broke out which the local Greek, Greek dynasty put down severely, even at one time installing a statue of Zeus in the temple. 
This was called the abomination of desolation. Many Jews died as martyrs in the struggle against the imposition of Greek custom. However, outside of Palestine and all around the Mediterranean basin, Jews were settled in large numbers. They may have composed at one time about 10% of the Roman Empire. These Jews adapted the Greek language and many aspects of Hellenistic civilization while continuing to observe the main points of the law, the Sabbath, the dietary laws, circumcision. They worked out a system by which they could sit at the table with Gentiles uh, while not sharing all the same foods. And they solved the marriage problem by converting the non-Jewish partner to Judaism. In addition, many other Gentiles were on their own part converted, uh, in, were on their own converted either partly or wholly to Judaism, being attracted by the monotheism and the stricter moral code. Educated Jews began to regain their pride in their religion and defend it using the resources of Greek philosophy. They thus affected the next step in the history of the Judaic world outlook, its entrance into European culture. The main agent in this step was the philosopher Philo of Alexandria, who is a much more important person than most histories of philosophy uh, tell you. Philo of Alexandria. He lived about the time of Jesus, and he was a Platonist. He was, in fact, called the Jewish Plato. His aim was to present Judaism as a school of philosophy superior to Greek philosophy and in every way intellectually respectable. His method was to take the main points of the Judaic worldview, state them in Greek concepts, argue for them from Greek premises, and finally conclude that Judaism was the best, the most cogent, the most unassailable intellectual position, a position which Plato, Aristotle, and the Stoics had only dimly foreshadowed. They had dimly foreshadowed Judaism in the sense that they, the Greek philosophers, had discovered by their own reason the existence of a supreme being whom they called God or Hotheos. Plato called him the world architect. Aristotle called him the unmoved mover. And the Stoics called him the mind of the universe. The divine being had, said Philo, been discovered by the unaided human reason. But, and here is a crucial point which we reverberated down the halls of the history of philosophy, only God's existence had been discovered, not his essence or nature. Philo was the first to introduce the claim that from man's point of view, there is a distinction between the existence and the essence of God. And then to claim further knowledge that knowledge of God's essence was unattainable by the human reason. In other words, we can discover that he exists, but not what he is. What the Greek philosophers had discovered without knowing it was Yahweh, the Jewish God, said Philo. God is, in fact, Yahweh, and Yahweh is God. But the Greek philosophers were sadly mistaken in imagining that they understood the nature of the being they had discovered. In his essence, God is ineffable, indescribable. Here Philo introduced three new terms to refer to the essence of God, ineffable, unnameable, and incomprehensible. Ineffable, unnameable, incomprehensible. Only from Philo onward were these names used in Greek philosophy when referring to God, including Neoplatonism. Previous Greek thinkers had regarded God as knowable, as intelligible. But, said Philo, that was because they'd mistakenly conceived him as having form and therefore as finite. Actually, God is without form and infinite, as the Bible implies. Now, the Greeks had always believed that the infinite was incomprehensible, and so most Greek thinkers denied that there was any actual infinite being. But Philo, while agreeing that the infinite was incomprehensible, taught that there was an incomprehensible, 
an infinite God, Yahweh, who could not be understood or destroyed. Philo had another modification to offer to Greek philosophy. Greek philosophy taught that God acts out of inner necessity, that he must fashion the world because he is, said Plato, not jealous and wishes to share his being. No, said Philo, this is all a mistake. God freely chooses to create. He is not compelled by his nature to do so. As a matter of fact, I might add, the Jewish God, who is the true God, is jealous. He is not going to share his divine nature with anyone. So God is a being of arbitrary will, for in the exercise of this will, there is no impelling reason to serve as a motive for action. Then he said, God is concerned with man's destinies. He introduced the notion of particular providence. Whereas the Greeks had thought that God was responsible for the major features of the universe, or at least for some of them, they did not think that he concerned himself with such trivial matters as the fate of individual human beings or the course of history. But now Philo said he did. The next doctrine he introduced was that God had created the universe out of nothing. This was a new doctrine of creation. According to Philo, God both created the universe out of nothing and gave it certain unvarying laws. Before the creation, God could have refrained from creating at all, or he could have created another universe governed by different laws of nature. So Philo originated the idea that our universe is only one of a number of possible worlds. That our universe exists and that the laws of nature are the ones that they are, this is an arbitrary fact conceived in the, by the will of God. They're brute facts dependent upon God's original caprice. The necessity of the laws of nature is further limited by the fact that God can turn them off if he wants to. He can suspend them. This is known as a miracle, of course. Philo repeats that all the state, that he repeats often the statement, all things are possible uh, to God. Then he introduced the notion that knowledge comes not only by reason, but by revelation, grasped by faith. To these changes in the Greek metaphysical point of view, Philo adds an epistemological change, namely that nature, uh, namely that knowledge comes by revelation, the revelation on Sinai, the written law, the utterances of the prophets, the inspired interpretations of the rabbis constituting the oral law. Revelation has to be grasped by faith. It connects the discoveries of reason and it adds to them it revises them when necessary. By revelation, we know that the universe is not eternal, that it was arbitrarily selected by God out of a number of possible universes, and that it was created in time. By revelation, we know that God is good in spite of all the evil in the world, for God has his own standard of value unknown to us. All these changes in Greek thought were, of course, radical transformations affecting the very substance of the Greek outlook and negating the Greek outlook and content while accepting the conceptual framework of the Greek outlook. Philo thus advanced the cause of the Judaic world outlook by putting at its disposal the weapons of Greek philosophy. But he did more than that. He prepared the way for Christianity he did this by introducing into his philosophy the concept of the logos, L-O-G-O-S. The logos, or the word of God. As a good Platonist, he had to believe in the Platonic forms. But as a good Jew, he could, he, he could not believe that the forms could be eternal, since only God was eternal. Philo, therefore, declared that God had created a second quasi-divine being, the Logos, whom he called the first begotten Son of God. 
The Platonic forms were all ideas in the mind of the Logos, and as a vast system of ideas formed what Plato called, what Philo called the intelligible world. God then used the Logos as his agent or intermediary in creating the sensible world in which we live. There is therefore a mediator between God and man. Now I realize it's getting rather late and I can stop here for the question period if you could like or I could finish it in five minutes or so. Which would you prefer? Go along to the five minutes or so? Okay, and then we'll have the question period, okay? For centuries, the Jews had looked for the coming of an ideal anointed king. By the first century AD, the normal Jewish concept of Messiah was that of a human leader who would drive out the occupiers, set up an independent Jewish state, an era of peace, justice, and prosperity for the whole world, ruled at least indirectly by the Jews. Some Jews, however, thought otherwise. They thought they saw their nation as an impossibly weak one, crushed by the weight of mighty empires around them. They thought that only a tremendous divine intervention could free the Jews from, from oppression. They expected this divine intervention to be coming ever sooner as things got worse and worse. In other words, the worse things got, the better the prospects. These people were called apocalypticists because they believed in books of revelation called apocalypses. These books believed or taught that after wars, famines, and plagues had nearly destroyed the world and the Jews were at their low point, the Messiah would then come, be manifested by God. The wicked world would rise up under an anti-Messiah, the origin of the idea of antichrist. The Messiah, invested by supernatural power, would then destroy the anti-Messiah and all his armies. Jerusalem would not only be cleaned up, it would be replaced by a celestial new Jerusalem prefabricated on high and let down to earth for Messiah to reign in. In and around this celestial city, the Jews no longer scattered would dwell in their ancient glory in that golden age of happiness promised in the covenant. And finally would come the resurrection of the dead. These doctrines revealed in the apocalyptic writings played a continuing underground role in the Judeo-Christian tradition. In the secularized Judaism of the 19th century, a strong attraction for socialism was one result. And then in the 20th century, Protestant Christianity produced the social gospel and Catholic Christianity, what is known as liberation theology. By the time of Jesus, there were four sects among the Jews, the Pharisees, the Zealots, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. The Pharisees, the Zealots, the Sadducees, and the people we call the Essenes or the Dead Sea sect. The Pharisees were the majority party. Not only did they accept the written law, they added a much more elaborate oral law. Esteemed for their piety and earnest prayer, they were generally popular. They accepted the doctrines of the immortality of the soul and the resurrection of the body and rewards and punishments after death. They also believed in a qualified doctrine of free will which chose between good and evil inclinations. They taught free will. They believed in the existence of angels. They took a passively disapproving attitude toward the Roman occupation. They looked for a Messiah to deliver them. Then came the zealots. They accepted the legal standpoint of the Pharisees, but they took up an aggressive attitude toward the Roman occupation. They despised all Jews who sought peace and conciliation with the Roman authorities. Extremists among the zealots resorted to terrorism and assassination and became known as dagger men. 
frequently haunting public places to strike down persons friendly to Rome. They played a leading role at the Battle of Masada in 73, where they committed suicide rather than surrender to the Romans. Then were the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the priestly party in charge of the temple. They accepted only the written law of the Bible. They denied the immortality of the soul, the resurrection of the body, the existence of angels. They apparently believed in a full doctrine of free will. They accepted Roman rule gladly and were generally wealthy and prosperous. They were the nearest equivalent in their day to the modern secular Jew. Finally, the Essenes, the Dead Sea sect, numbered only about 8,000. They lived in monastic communities in the East, holding all property in common. They were meticulous ritual purists, refusing to have anything to do with the temple, which they regarded as polluted. They lived ascetic lives of manual labor and seclusion, taking their communal meals in silence. Their scrolls were only discovered in the 1940s. They tell the story of their own persecution, set forth in great detail the rules they expect their members to observe, and they predict a coming war of the sons of light against the sons of darkness. Their closest analog uh, are probably the inhabitants of the kibbutzim in Israel and Jews who support Marxism. Finally, in 66 AD, the Jews revolted against Rome. The war lasted four years from 66 through 70. The Romans besieged Jerusalem, led by the general Titus, with 60,000 men and the latest siege equipment. The Jews had 25,000 men divided into factions as usual, but fighting bravely. The Romans, of course, took the city, burned the temple, massacred thousands, and then held a victory procession in Rome in which the most sacred objects of the temple were paraded in the streets. Titus's triumphal arch commemorating this event still stands in Rome. To the Jews was left the fortress of Masada on a rock 1,300 feet high, which had been captured by their hero, Menachem. But Menachem himself was murdered in a factional struggle and the Romans attacked the fortress, which held about a thousand men, women, and children. The result was inevitable, granting the systematic siege methods of the Romans. Eliezer, the new leader, either forced or persuaded the defenders to engage in an act of mass suicide, leaving storerooms full of food to prove the point to the Romans that they had died voluntarily. Two women, and five children survived. In 135 AD, the Jews again revolted against the Romans, and this time the Romans decided they'd had it. They destroyed Jerusalem, building on its ruins a new city called Aelia Capitolina, in whose center was the Temple of Jupiter. Thus, at least militarily, the Hellenistic spirit triumphed over the Hebraic spirit. But wait a minute, before the Jews were defeated, they had given birth to a child, Christianity. That will be the subject of the next lecture. Thank you. Can I take some questions? Limited to three minutes. Three questions. The people, the three most urgently uh, 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 questioning people, Jack. They broke the law. The, the question is, would, would you repeat it yourself, Jack? How was it that the principle 
They did it for their wives. <laughs> they built chapels for their wives. You know, like... The question was, since the Jews had been commanded to have no other gods but Yahweh, how was it that David and Solomon built these temples for foreign gods? And I replied, it was because, it was because of their foreign wives that they built the... Uh, temples. And anyway, anyway, neither David nor Solomon were great observers of the law. Think of David with Bathsheba and so on. So uh, he wasn't regarded as a saint, just as a great guy. <laughs> Any other? Yes. A very, very good point. Uh, the, uh, there was a similar religion, Zoroastrianism, as you know, which believed in absolute commandments, absolute God, the absolute distinction between good and evil, uh, the war of the sons of light against the sons of darkness. And this, too, was based upon a difference in economy in a way, except the Zoroastrians were defending the agricultural economy against incoming nomads. But it's curious that in both cases, the, the law of the absolutely transcendent God was identified with the defense of certain economic and political values. That's all I can say about it at the moment. I guess we've had our three questions. One more? Call them A and B. <laughs> what was he doing there? Yes. Well, the Jews were a tremendously large proportion of the population of Alexandria. They were very proud of him because he so rationally defended their point of view. But actually, the exact influence that he has had uh, has not been traced. That is, not many uh, later Jewish thinkers quote him for some centuries, and not many later Muslim thinkers or Christian thinkers, but he did lay down these principles which were very, very close to those of St. Thomas Aquinas and of Maimonides. And so I am assuming that with the, the arguments of his which we have, and with the fact that he uh, created this concept of the Logos, or the divine, semi-divine Son of God, which was certainly quoted in its time, that he did really have, he, he was a major thinker. That he was not what? Uh, I don't know whether the Library of Alexandria was burned down. It was supposed to have been burned down by the Muslims, but I 
don't think it was actually burned. I, I think it's a historical fiction. I'm not sure. Uh, his name was well known among the Neoplatonists, and they did reverence him. That's all I know. Okay, thank you very much.